Thanks for having me, Dan. Let me share my screen here and welcome everyone. Uh, everyone see my screen? All right. Yep. Yeah, good. Awesome. Well, look, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, as Dan shared, um, I recently published a new book, The Product-Led Organization, and I kind of want to take um, – uh, the book kind of has three three parts of the product-led journey, and the, the last part I want to focus uh, this conversation on, and really is talking about a new way of delivering product. And um, to set the stage for us, you know um, – Dan shared in my bio that I was once a chief scientist at Borland. Um, many of you um, uh, probably have heard of Borland from the compiler days, Delphi, um, uh, definitely a historic tech company in, in the Bay Area. And, you know, it, it, one of the stories I remember so vividly from there is, is the fact that, you know, Borland had a history of shipping CDs and shipping boxes. So um, Borland actually acquired the companies I was at. We had downloadable software, desktop software, mind you, but download. And um, um, yet yeah, Borland had a history of like physical boxes on shelves. And I never forget being tasked with like designing a box and talking about what we're going to put on it. You know, uh, now mind you, our, our software costs ten thousand dollars, and like it wasn't a normal software you'd walk into a store and purchase. It was very much a B two B software. But um, what I realized at the time is that that a lot of our practices, um, a lot of how we thought about delivering products, was was formed and developed around um, shipping software on a on a annual or semi annual cadence because we literally printed mediums. So the way we interact with the customers, the way we uh, gathered feedback, the entire way we shipped and created software was built upon, um, you know, this is what we have to do and how do we build process and practices um, uh, to, to effectively do that. Now you fast forward to today where, um, of course, well, from, from this point, you know, my, my next company, of course, worked a little bit on uh, on-premise software, which of course is is hosted, but on-premise that requires a new set of practices. Um, but now, of course, many, if not all, of us um, have some experience or some focus on cloud-based shipping, and it's just fundamentally different. And um, it's really um, companies that are more cloud-focused; uh, they often have a have a goal of putting product at the center of the customer experience and that's that's a lot of what we talk about in the book is putting product at the center of the customer experience but it means rethinking how you deliver products how you create products ship products how you organize product needs to be rethought um, for for being more product led and i want to share some of those ways and some of those ideas and hopefully it'll stimulate more questions and, and more dialogue around it and you know, one of the the earliest examples i think about shifting the way we work was etsy like i, I remember reading about and hearing about it and then even talking with some of the, the folks at that etsy who uh, uh for those who don't know kind of famous in the industry for one of the early pioneers in continuous release where um, they would ship so software so frequently um, that if there was some sort of problem or some sort of issue, they could quickly roll back, they could diagnose it and continuing um, to, to roll out. So um, um, now I think for some companies and some organizations, this was seen maybe as you know one end of a spectrum, but what I loved was that it was challenging the ways we're delivering, it's challenging the way we're shipping, it's challenging how we organize ourselves because shipping many, many times a day requires a different organization than say shipping twice a year, uh, say on a physical medium, right? Like the way you think about it, the way you engage, honestly, your feedback loops, everything is fundamentally different um, when you think about it in this manner. And, and what's powerful if you rethink your org and uh, think about changing the way you're working, it really enables speed. And, you know, if I think about one of the hallmark attributes that we're trying to get to with product-led organizations is speed. You know, when, um, when you're on this product-led journey, um, you want to be able to go fast because you want to be able to 
quickly iterate, quickly shift. And, you know, of course, a lot of this is inspired by the lean startup movement and, and, and other associated movements. But like this notion of speed is critically important. And that becomes a driver with how you want to organize your, your, your organization, specifically your product organization. So, so the first thing I want to talk a little bit about, and I'm going to cover kind of three broad areas of how evolve your product. And the first one is this notion of launch. And as I shared, I started my career, um, you know, with a very traditional launch, you know, and, and uh, even traditional launch events. And, um, you know, I, I, even at actually Rally, which was a cloud-based software company, I, I once did a three city launch tour, um, very, very big bang. Um, now, some of that was driven by marketing, and I, I can talk a little bit more about about that that experience. But uh, launch is always um, seen as a critically important function in product and product marketing. Um, but you have an opportunity to really rethink it. And and again, in the, the early days, we thought about release as a as a big bang, you know, build, um, and then ship. Um, now I've seen you know we have a lot more opportunity for something much more variable. And uh, um, you know, on, on the right, I, I have um, a different way to think about um, a release cycle. But what I've seen is different um, styles of release, all focused on generating different feedback and, and ultimately changing the way we, we ship software. So um, you may have a, a stage when you're shipping software that goes out um, internally. This is something I've done many times in my career. And this is particularly useful when you're building a product that you yourselves can use. But dropping the build out on your internal subscription is a really, really powerful way to, to get feedback. I mean, obviously tell your internal users, hey, you're, you're trying out software that no one else is using. But um, it's an opportunity to get feedback from a friendly audience. Um, but it's also an opportunity, almost a hack for enablement. You know, if you're putting it out there and people are playing with it, uh, it's an opportunity to start educating them on the capabilities prior to an end customer touching it and starting to use it. You know, one of the classic you know, challenges you'll hear when you're shipping things is if you don't do a poor job of enablement, um, you know, customers can be asking support questions about a piece of software that they themselves have no idea how to use, right? So, so this internal step, um, uh, can be a really useful feedback loop. Um, now you notice on the right, talk about feature flags. You know, I, I I cover feature flags pretty extensively in the book. You know, I, I do think it's it's one of the core foundational technologies and capabilities that is um, it's must have if you're starting to rethink the way you do release. And, I, and I'll share for a few reasons. You know. Um, the power of feature flags is that it enables your engineering teams to operate at a very fast cadence while the product and product marketing teams can control when users actually see it and which users, et cetera, right? So, uh, you know, like one of the common challenges when, you, when teams moving really, really fast is that you have this potentially impedance mismatch between what you want your engineering and product organizations to be doing from a build perspective and what your customers and users can handle. You know, I, I don't know if you've been in scenarios where you've had a customer call you and says, like, slow down. Like, like my users can't handle the change you're injecting on them. And that's because, again, this impedance mismatch, if, if, if you're, injecting change on your users as fast as you're able to build them, um, it actually may degrade the experience. And, and I know it seems counterintuitive because you're feeling, wow, don't they want all this innovation? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> People are really, really busy. Like they, they can't necessarily um, digest all of your innovation while they're also dealing with other, uh, other software products in their lives um, as well as other functions, right? So I think it's feature flagging helps allows, allows organizations to decouple the pace of uh, engineering and product from the pace of what users can ingest. Um, so that's kind of foundational to this process. So I talked about internal. Um, limited beta, of course, is the option to have uh, companies potentially opt in. 
um, but it's it's a limited select group of customers. And, and this is a powerful idea, you know, and um, you may want to limit based on risk. Okay, I only want to test this on very low risk customers that are accustomed to giving us feedback. That's one way. You may want to have the opposite approach. I want to limit this on high risk customers because if I want, you know, if anything happens, I want to know about it earlier than GA. You know, maybe you have a, a customer that has certain performance characteristics that you just, you can't simulate and test and you want to put it out there in a limited beta format um, to get feedback back to product and engineering. That's another great use of, of a limited beta. Um, but you know, I, I've also seen this used as a almost a selling feature. Maybe you have the notion of a, a customer advisory board that as a member of this advisory board, the customer gets early access to new technology so that they can shape the finished product. And this is something that if you're in a B2B world, um, or even if you have a highly engaged B2C user community, your, your users in some cases will care so much about your product that they themselves want to be part of the creation process. They almost want to co-create the outcome. And the more opportunities you give them to help shape the outcome, uh, the higher the sentiment you're going to engender with them. So using a limited beta for um, creating that that tighter tighter partnership is is very very valuable. Um, and then from there, once you feel comfortable that you, you you want to open up, and open beta obviously is a great way to signal to the market that hey, this thing is early, but it's ready for everyone to try. Um, I, I I like having open beta periods. I mean, when something's called beta, like our natural psychological instinct is that okay it's it, i will accept the fact that it won't be won't be maybe as complete as i would have expected it or maybe i may encounter something unexpected um it sets a little bit of a lower bar and of course um general availability is when it's done and, and i think there's a, a lot of power and in, in, in flexibility in this i mean and and you have um uh you, know, you can run these sections as long as you want i mean i think we all remember when gmail was beta for years um, you know, and, and arguably it, it, it um, for a lot of us, we probably treated it as a GA product, but, but it was very clear um, that, that Google had, had thrown out there as, as beta and they were still experimenting and still collecting feedback before they, they thought it, they thought internally it, it was done. So this is a, a powerful way to do it. Again, you can have this across years. You can have this process across weeks. I mean, it really depends on the, the pace of feedback that you're getting and and how fast you want to do it. I think a couple of things to think about though is when you're thinking about this process is um, to have, or I would encourage you to have internal controls on what criteria you want to see for the product to get promoted through these different phases. The last thing you want is to have a, a product where a large percentage of the features are designated as beta. Um, I think your users may think, okay, what am I purchasing if I'm most of this product is beta? So that's kind of an anti-pattern or concern to, to think about as you're rethinking the release. Another probably more tangible example of, of what I like to, a technique I like to use in beta is this, this whole ability to do an opt-in or even what I call an opt-out beta, but, um, you can ship a new page and, and this is an example that we ourselves use, but plenty of products do this. Um, but then going back to um, the legacy page is a button that you can um, that offer to the users. And what's powerful about this is um, you're, 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 you know, when you're releasing something new and you ask someone, do you wanna try something new? You're giving someone a choice. And some people just don't like change or are averse to change. So they may not opt into it. Putting someone on a brand new page and telling them, if you really don't like this thing, you can go back to the other one. It's gonna elicit a different type of response. Um, because people don't like change, they may, may just, they don't even wanna check it out. You're gonna get far fewer people that potentially opt in. But if th this opt out um, technique um, allows you to really test 
you know, how different and how painful is this, this new experience? And um, I often use this as a test for when something is, is ready to come out of beta. When I get to a point where, um, you know, two weeks of cohort of users who try something for the first time, don't go back to um, the old page or maybe two weeks is short, maybe four weeks, uh, depending on your product. Maybe it's a good time to just eliminate the legacy page. But this is a, 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 a great technique. I've used this many times in my, my career. I you know, it's a, it's a, it's a cool way to, to get this test. Um, but you're not actually you know, necessarily telling your users or customers that you're, t you're testing on them, but of course, of course you are. It's a great way to get feedback on when something is ready to ascend to that next level. Now, I think the key too is when we're, we're shipping these things and we're, we're, we're trying to promote um, uh, these new capabilities that we want to be focused on driving adoption. You know, I, I, one of my biggest um, pet peeves, and frankly, one of the reasons I started Pendo is that uh, all too often in product, the, the focus feels like shipping the feature. And, um, and, you know, I often say, you know, all of our celebrations and we would always be drinking beer when something shipped shipping parties we rarely had beer on adoption parties um which is actually the goal so you know shipping something starts the clock on the ultimate outcome you're trying to drive which is which is well one adoption and then hopefully adoption will then lead to value delivery back to the end user right so so um you know, when you're rethinking your release, I, I, I would often encourage you to not declare done until um, uh, you've hit your business case to your goals or whatever you're trying to do and, you know, when, when you built this feature. And, you know, um, as Dan said in my, earlier in my career, I was at Rally and we, we managed our product team at the Epic initiative level using pretty, pretty large Kanban boards and, um, our last step always on the Kanban board was called collecting evidence. Shipping was always prior to, of course, collecting evidence. And I mean, actually, fun fact, our Kanban board used to reflect our release process. We would have an internal column and then we'd have clear criteria when things get promoted to limited general availability, et cetera, et cetera. But then the last column, again, was always, are we seeing what we hope to see? Are we getting the adoption? And we would have initiatives hold out at that epic level and collecting evidence until we delivered on the outcomes we were trying to deliver. That means teams would still be reserving backlog for it. We'd still be iterating on it. We'd still be uh, um, focused on, on driving that adoption. I think that's, that's really, really key is you think the release is making sure you understand the true, the true goal, the true goal for us is adoption and customer value realization. It's not, of course, just shipping the feature. Now we're talking a lot about shipping. I think the other way to think of rethink of releases is how do we remove things? How do we let go? And you know, people call it often things like sunsetting features as well. And um, I have a whole chapter in the book on this subject and um, I'm actually very, very passionate about this. I could probably talk for an hour just on different techniques to, to let, let things go. So I think in this talk, I wanted to tease out these three examples and I highlighted um, in the book this this medium post, and I included it right here, uh, written by Herb Caudill about six rewrite uh, stories. And I think it's, I think it's an awesome read. I think it's, um, and th these are actually just <laughs> six of other camp examples that I I've seen around you know classically sunsetting things, but this is specifically around product level sunsets and product level rewrites. Um, if you've been involved in a rewrite in your career, um, well, they're pretty painful. <laughs> I'll just throw it out there. I, I haven't been in many rewrites that I've like walked away saying, wow, that was an awesome experience. So like, no, there's oh, you, you learn a lot. I mean, uh, you know, to things that are large batches that, um, you know, the, the, you're, you're always competing what's called parity. Um, parity is a thing you already have in market. You know, rewrites are challenging. They're just one of the harder things to manage um, from a product engineering perspective. Uh, um, but but here, here's three fresh examples that, that um, I, I think are 
really, really unique. You know, there's, uh, you know, many of you are probably familiar with the product Basecamp and 30 Second Signals. And um, what's, what's really cool about the way they've done rewrites is that they have built new versions of the same product and not sunsetted the prior versions. And done it twice with Basecamp. So they, they, the original Basecamp, they, they built Basecamp 2, and then they built Basecamp 3. And of course, they offered promotions for people to upgrade to the new versions. And of course, the new versions had some capabilities that the prior versions had. But you know, their, their, their fundamental thesis always was, look, I mean, this is a good product that people were paying for. Yes, we wanted to rethink it. Yes, we had new ideas. Yes, we didn't want to get constrained to that design, and that, that paradigm, but, but it's delivering value and people can opt in for the new thing that they want. And we don't need to like force them off the thing that they're getting value out of and they're pretty happy. It's a good product, you know? And, and um, this is a really powerful um, product-led way of, of advancing and, and and uh, evolving your customer base. So like they have in each particular instance, uh, come up with a new version and um, let customers opt in. And, and I think that that's worked out very, very well and very successful. And, you know, FreshBooks is actually a really interesting story and, um, and, and interesting for, for me as well. Like, um, FreshBooks uh, wanted to develop um, uh, a new version of their product, but was familiar with all the challenges with rewrites, et cetera. So what they did is they uh, they went so far to build a competitor called Billspring. Uh, I don't know if individuals in the audience know this. Um, and they actually launched it. Um, they, they registered a new domain name. They launched it. It looked like seemingly an entire new company um, focused on a new app. Um, uh, fun fact, we had to have partnered with, with them on that, that launch. So we're pretty familiar with, with, um, with that and some of their goals with it. But um, the goal is to see, can this new product beat our existing product? And over time, they started to see very, very positive results. Uh, I think for them, and it's cited in the article that they, they knew they'd kind of, you know, quote unquote, won once they were getting customers saying, yeah, we're, we're you know, we're, um, sad to leave FreshBooks for a new platform and that new platform happened to be built. <laughs> so they built a competitor that beat their original product, which, which really what the, the goal was. And over time, they eventually kind of educated the market and say, hey, hey, this is actually the next version of, of our product and, you know, came up with the migration plat path, but it was a really powerful way to think about what, how do we create a new version of something, um, really test it well and ultimately let it kind of uh, take over for the existing product. So that's a cool example. And the last example uh, uh, cited it, or the highlight is uh, Inbox versus Gmail. So if you remember, uh, Inbox was a wholly new app, a uh, way to interact with your Gmail account. Um, it was just different to be quite honest. And uh, there's certain things that it didn't do that only the Gmail client do that you'd have to go back and forth um, but there's certain things that it did, of course, that that um, uh, the Gmail client didn't do. And they, and the, the the cool thing is they use a like alternate UI as almost an experiment playground. They put new capabilities in it. They test it. Um, all in all, I think we know what happened here. Here is a the end of life uh, inbox. But what's what's cool is they took some of the best capabilities, some of the most used features in inbox, things that people liked in it. And they simply put it back in the Gmail client. So then. Uh, those of us who love the Gmail client got the best of the inbox experience um, uh, without without having a shift. So that's an example of where they they built what could have been a replacement or could have been a competitor, but really at the entire time was just an experiment used to generate learnings that ultimately folded back into the core product. And sometimes it's easier to experiment in alternate UI than it is to experiment in your core UI. And that's certainly what it was in this case. Um, and it could be for you as well. So these are just three examples. But I think um, they're all powerful because we all have this challenge where, you know, or many of us have this challenge where we have, you know, once you've been around for some number of years, you're going to have pressure to create something new. And we probably should rewrite this piece. Maybe there's tech debt. There could be like tech debt reasons. There could be 
user experience reasons. There could be um, market reasons that you want to do a rewrite. There's lots of different ways to do it. And I encourage you to, to be intentional with whatever um, strategy you take, but there's lots of different ways to, to think about doing this um, wisely. So that's the first section. Um, the second section is talks about how we we engage more with our customers, you know, and and um, of course the more we engage with customers, the more we're engaging we as, as a business are. And and you know the, the area I want to talk first about that's kind of near and dear to my heart uh, is, is feedback. Um, once you ship something in market, people have opinions on it. And one of the biggest challenges is, uh, we have as product managers is managing all of that disparate feedback because it comes into us through Slack channels, emails, um, video calls, um, Zendesk tickets, um, you name it, you're going to have people giving you feedback. Of course, that feedback can vary from defects and issues, just feature requests. Um, it can come from customers and users, of course, but it could also come from internal stakeholders. I mean, very, very often our sales engineers, technical account managers, customer success managers, even our sales reps have really strong feedback based on what they're hearing, on, on, on what they're collecting, et cetera. And, and what I often see in companies is without a clear process for it, it becomes a tangled web and mess. You end up with, how many times have I seen the sales top 10 list, support top 10 list, customer success top 10 list? But of course, having three top 10 lists, um, that, that's in addition to product. It's kind of hard to, 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 to um, uh, prioritize across three lists, all of which are the top 10. So I would encourage folks to, to set up more structure so that everything goes into a single place. You don't need 10 top 10 lists. You need a single unified way to look at priority. Um, and, you know, having a strategy here is, is really, really important. And when I think about prioritization, one of the first things I think about is this notion of like voting. And um, it's, it's one of the classic things that we as product uh, like to do. And there's, there's lots of different strategies. And um, I'm going to introduce a few, and, and some of you may or may not be familiar with all these, but uh, and talk a little bit to pros and cons, but, but uh, this is just a, a couple ways to think about voting. Um, you know, the first one, just kind of basic voting, like, do you want this or do you not want this? This could be an up, this could be a down. You could ju just have up, which, yes, I want this. You could have, no, I don't want this. Um, but these are very, very basic ways to get some assessment for for value of the feature, who wants it, et cetera. Um, basic voting is really, really easy. Um, the other nice benefit of basic voting is that um, without the constraint, uh, you do get a fairly accurate picture of everyone that would benefit from something. And, and by tracking these votes, it also creates an opportunity for you to create feedback back to those users or customers when you actually ship that thing. So if you ask people just broadly, do they want something? And a whole bunch of people say, yes, then you ship that thing. You can tell all those people, hey, we listened to you. We shipped this thing. This is really, really awesome. Um, now, budget voting is a, a nuanced version of this is where you give um, users or customers certain number of points to apply into certain number of areas. And um, you, you folks may have played, you know, some of the you know, innovation games like buy a feature, uh, things like that. Um, uh, this is basically a productized version of that. It's very, very similar. Whereas you have fixed uh, amount of credits, points, whatever you want to call them, to vote on what features. And, and the power of this to the customers, it, it, it forces the customer to think like you, the product manager, because we all know the product, we, we can't get everything we want. It is like, you know, to do one thing, you have to not do another thing. <laughs> and that's just, you know, part of the challenge and both the fun of product is that, you know, if it's all I want, I want, I want, um, there's, no, there's no sense of trade-off. And budget helps force the trade-off, which generally leads to a more accurate view of priority. 
So if you, again, in basic law, everyone to vote and everyone wants everything, okay, maybe not the best way to stack rank or um, to understand priority. However, it creates better feedback loops. Budget voting creates a, a um, more accurate view of, of what's actually more important because by forcing someone not to vote something, they're, 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 they're having it in their head to make a trade-off decision. Um, now, another technique similar to budget voting, uh, which also forced the trade-off technique is something called pairwise voting. Pairwise voting is more of a process and it's a little bit harder to implement. It's that um, you give the users successive two options, pairs essentially, and allow them to pick which one's more important in which context. And if you show enough permutations of this, you can end up generating a fairly accurate um, set of priorities based on that user feedback because you're forcing them, again, of course, to look at a whole number of areas and pick which ones are, are more important than others. So that's another technique, again, leveraging this to, to drive priority. Um, now, when thinking about um, managing feedback, I think it's also really, really important to, to publish your feedback strategy to your customers and users. This is an example from one of our customers, Kajabi, who did this awesome video and, and, and shared this with, with their user base. But um, it's an opportunity first to say, to help instruct uh, users, how do you want to get feedback? Um, some product management teams you know, prefer, I think we all prefer actually, the users to articulate the pain they're trying to solve rather than that simply try, trying to uh, ask for a solution. Well, if you want that, it's, I'd encourage you to, to communicate that very, very directly, potentially put in the form, what is the pain you're trying to solve? But the second thing they communicate um, is, um, what will you do with that feedback? What should they expect? Will they get an automated response? Will they get a personalized response? Will they get no response? Um, is it gonna go into a black hole? Like tell your users that, hey, once we get this feedback, this is our process for triaging it, for answering it, for this is what you're going to hear about it. Uh, but it's also okay to, um, to uh, communicate expectations. Like, hey, we get a lot of requests we may not get to every single one of them. One of my favorite stories is Atlassian back in the early days when you submitted a feature request in the automated response back, they would tell you what uh, top several feature requests they were working on. So it was like, hey, thank you for asking us for this thing. And oh, by the way, here are the three things we are working on. Because sometimes your users are asking for things and then they hear, oh, these are the three things that, that they are working on. Like, oh, there's, there's actually, they, they may think they sound more important, which is a really good thing for you. So and again, it's creating these two-way two communication feedback loops. And of course, you know, communicating how to get started and where to do it and, and um, how, again, how the process is gonna work. So that's a uh, great, great um, strategy there. And then of course, last but not least, once you get this feedback, once you get it organized into a single source of truth, once you are able to get some proxy for prioritization through some voting means, um, this allows you to have a roadmap that's really connected to voice of the customer. So, so here's an interesting example of um, actually Bendo. Uh, we actually took our top you know, 10 list, so to speak, and um, just prioritize the team's backlog off of it. Now, this doesn't mean that our entire product organization is just focused on items that are being voted on by our customers or users, but it does mean that I can say that we allocate, I don't know, 10% of our engineering capacity to just customer requests, just voice to the customer, just um, very, very, you know, customer directed um, outcomes and that's that's valuable it helps create more loyalty and it drives retention so it's a it's a great way to um, have the voice of the customer in the room now the, the last piece that i want to talk a little bit about is, is roadmaps and, and roadmaps is another discussion that we could talk a lot about and and i know there's 
I mean, probably if we have 40 product managers on the phone, we probably have 40 different opinions on roadmaps. You know, I, I can see uh, some people don't believe in them at all. Some people think they're, they're necessary. Some people think they're evil. I mean, I, I, I've heard it all from pretty much every product manager. Um, um, I'll give you my take on roadmaps. I mean, for me, roadmaps are a communication tool. That is what they are. They are a way to communicate your current prioritization to your user base uh, as a way to elicit feedback. You know, um, I, I love putting roadmaps in, in front of customers or users and just saying, well, what do you think? How does this align with what you want to see? What's missing? What are you seeing that you hadn't thought of? You know, it, it's a great way to start a conversation. And of course, most roadmaps I see, this one doesn't have it on, it says subject to change or, you know, and usually when I, when I would present one, I would say the things you see on the left are probably very unlikely to change, they may be in progress, the things just you know, to the right of that are a little more likely to change and the things to the right of that are more likely to change than even that. So like setting people's expectations that, hey, this is subject to change but also setting expectations that, hey, customer, user, you can influence this thing. Now, of course, we all know how to caveat roadmaps as well. Um, just because something shows up on a roadmap does not mean like an engineer committed it. Uh, I would also encourage you um, that you shouldn't be showing, en uh, excuse me, customers roadmaps that your engineers have not seen. That's one of the fastest ways to irritate your engineering team is to show uh, a customer that they're working on you know, something that they've never even heard of, right? So it's, this is a great way to, uh, I would encourage you to show it internally, get some buy-in. It's also a very good tool to communicate vision to the team so they can start thinking about what's coming down the pipeline. But then once you have that, um, uh, the, the team high level buy-in, again, it's not a commitment, it's a high level buy-in, getting in front of users and customers as a communication tool um, to help solicit feedback is, um, I found it to be really, really powerful um, way to create, again, more, more customer loyalty and, and more connectedness with your customers. So the last thing I wanna talk a little bit about is product operations or product ops. Um, uh, this is a new role and, and really we've dubbed it or I've dubbed the, the orchestrator here um, uh, in that we're talking about release, we're talking about managing feedback and you know, the, one of the, the most common questions I get is who manages all this stuff? You know, um, who manages our um, feedback program? Who, who manages the rollout, the consistency of across our release cycle and launch and the coordination of all these things? And, and what I typically saw before a product operations roles is different product managers who had passion about different areas here just took on these responsibilities as part of their role. And one of the biggest challenges with the product management role is it's so diverse anyway, like adding a sprinkling of all these different tasks onto the role does not make their job easier. It makes it a whole heck of a lot harder. Um, and um, so I, I think, so we've seen product ops has emerged as a way to free product management up to still do product management while creating consistency and structure and organization around all of these other aspects of what product needs to accomplish. And a large part of it's alignment. It's working cross-functionally. Um, you know, in the case of managing feedback where a lot of the stakeholders are internal, having a single group who's managing that feedback on behalf of the product managers takes a ton off those individuals' plates. Um, specifically when, you know, very often most organizations, a company's customer success team is actually larger than its product team. It's very difficult for a product manager to understand which of the 12 CSMs they have to interact with to get feedback, right? That's just not scalable. So having a product operations team sit here in the middle and help be that orchestration um, team, I think is, is critically important. And Look, and here's just a very practical way that our you know, product op teams runs um, runs those meetings, you know, and, and it covers everything from sales requests. Was what, what's happening in our sales, or what are we seeing trends-wise? Um, customer success input, uh, customer commits. From time to time, you may 
have a contractual commit from a customer who manages that at a high level across all teams. So we understand where there's risk um, in our planning cycles. Um, review of customer feedback and roadmaps, you know, helping create organization. If, if we need to um, even potentially create a specialized roadmap for, you know, a customer or, or some other situation, analysts, you can have the product operations team handle this. Competitive intelligence, a beta is and launches. Like, how are we doing? Like I, I mentioned it's collecting evidence step. Who's making sure we checked in on, on, the, on the collecting evidence and we're, we're getting data and validating our launches. An MPS review, if you're getting MPS feedback, and this of course depends on your company and whether you're doing this and which team owns it, but you know, I think product operations is a, is a good candidate for owning NPS, specifically product NPS and helping you understand how to take action uh, around it. Because if you're getting in a broad number, figuring out again, who in product should be getting which piece of feedback, et cetera. Again, product ops can be this, this orchestration group. And then last but not least is managing a tool stack. I mean, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of tools out there. I mean, I just look at the sponsors for, for uh, the, this meetup and um, that they represent a, a whole set of different types of product that we on um, product management teams um, can now use to enable our, our jobs. I mean, I remember the days when we just had good old fashioned spreadsheets and PowerPoint present and you know, PowerPoints, but um, I love the fact that we have a diverse set of solutions now that can help us be more efficient and effective at our job. I mean, um, this is just a, a set of different solutions um, that, that we publish at Pendo that we've kind of collected, but um, who, what's your process for deciding on the tool stick? How do they all integrate? Who's the administrator for them? Who provisions them? Um, these are all good questions. Do you really want your product managers dealing with that? Of course not. Like this is a great example of, of having a centralized group, which, um, make sure they're implemented well, there's consistencies across them, so there's probably conventions needed so that there isn't a sprawled mess when one goes to use them. Having lightweight guides on practices, best practices, et cetera. This is, um, uh, again, you would much rather have a centralized group do this than just one of your product managers adding it to that person's tasks. That, that's definitely less scalable. So look, I mean, I covered a lot. Uh, I told Dan I was gonna talk for 20 minutes and I, I think I could talk for a lot more than that. So, um, so you can see that putting product to the center of your, your customer experience, there's a lot of aspects of how you can rethink um, how, you, how you deliver products. And I mean, the challenge I ask you is how can your org evolve? Like how have you changed your practices to keep up with, um, uh, the product-led movement and becoming more more product-led. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've done a piece of it. Maybe you can do more. But that's the the, the piece. I hope you you pull away from this. Just some tidbit on something you can try or experiment or um, you know, potentially do to to um, again keep up with that evolution. Because uh, you want to be in the driver's seat. Uh, the last thing you want to do um, is have the you know the product led movement drive you so to speak i mean i, I think this is a great opportunity to, to take control and, and lead the change for your company hey folks i know we don't need to do this but let's try doing these things to become more connected with our customers to um, change the way we think you know releases um to again to start start being leaders and moving your company to be more product led and you now we you know one of the greatest pleasures that i have is working with fantastic organizations around the world. These are just three of them, all of which have done some, um, you know, taking bits and pieces of these techniques to, to help drive their business. I, mean, I think I'll start, you know, Firefly actually is one of the uh, better examples of product operations team that they've used to help again, create more consistency and structure around um, the release process and, um, and the product feedback process. Um, Rapid7, um, We've done a lot of work on operationalizing their design process. Of, uh, and I didn't talk as much about this in this talk, but uh, they're definitely on the forefront of how you create more um, um, more structure and, and scale for design. And Jamf has just done amazing works um, leveraging product analytics and looking at data to improve their onboarding experience and to help um, honestly create better outcomes uh, for their users by 
make sure they focus on adoption and not just shipping the features.